Are you struggling to structure the scenes in your fantasy novel? You're not alone. When I work with writers, I see a lot of them grapple with the difficulties of scene structure, which is a big issue because it's so fundamental to telling a great story. But through my experience as an author, I've found that there is a simple six step process you can use to consistently write great scenes in your fantasy book. And once you understand how all six pieces of this structure work together, you'll be able to effortlessly write great scenes that develop your characters, progress your plot, and make readers fall in love with your story. And you'll also start to see this six part structure absolutely everywhere because so many accomplished fantasy authors know the power of using this system in their own books. And the first step is to define your character's goal. Defining the goal is very simple. You simply write down what does your character want. Maybe your character is questing for a particular item. Perhaps they are searching for a particular person. Maybe they want to feel a specific emotion or they actually want a particular response from another character. Perhaps they are expressing their love to this other character and they're hoping this other character reciprocates in kind. Perhaps your character is wanting to stop someone from doing something. Or maybe the character wants to make someone else do something instead. Perhaps they're trying to manipulate them into taking a certain action. Your character's goal might be to find safety or your character might be attempting to resolve a question. So there's lots of different options for your goal in your scene. But how do we make sure you're actually picking a good goal for your character to pursue? There's a few fundamental principles that I've found important for this. First of all, it's really important that your main character's goal relates to the central premise and the conflict of your story. To do that, you should be making sure that your goal is relating to your character's arc in some way. It's forming a particular step within the character's arc for the character to go through. And by doing this, you create a strong natural sense of progression from scene to scene. Really, when you're writing the scenes in your book, you wanna create the sense that each scene, each moment in your story is naturally and organically leading into the next. And you also wanna make sure that something significant has changed by the end of your scene. So if you find in your story that you're failing in those two categories, that is, it doesn't feel like things are changing in this scene, and it also doesn't feel like this is part of the natural chain of cause and effects without the story, and I could cut it out without the story really being affected, then that's a really good sign that you should cut this scene. You also wanna avoid repeating the same type of goal too many times in a row. So for example, if you have a murder mystery story where your characters are interviewing different suspects, the goal of the first interrogation scene will be, I'm going to interrogate this person to see what they know about the murder. If your next scene is them interrogating someone else and they've got the exact same goal, and then the scene after that is them interrogating someone else and they have the exact same goal, it might feel a bit repetitive because you're using the exact same scene format for your story. However, if you change things up a little bit and the first suspect gets interrogated in a police station, but then the second suspect is on the run and the de detectives actually have to find that suspect first before they can interrogate them, then the goal is subtly different. And there's a bit of variation in the scene format there, which keeps things exciting and it keeps the reader feeling like there's been progression and evolution in the plot. Now let's show a practical example of how you actually define a goal from a scene. And to do this, we'll be looking at Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Specifically, we're going to be looking at chapter 16, titled Through the Trapdoor. Now in this chapter, Harry, Ron, and Hermione uh, realize that Snape, in their minds, is going to go through the trapdoor into the secret chambers beneath Hogwarts where they believe the Philosopher's Stone is kept. And they think Snape is doing this so that he can get the stone and use it to bring Voldemort back to life and give him immortality. Now, as we go through this example, I'm gonna be using my scene structure template I've built for myself in Notion. I'll be linking to this template in the description down below if you wanna use it in your own stories and your own writing as well. Okay, so we're here in my scene mapping template in Notion, which is basically a really easy way to structure your scenes and kind of lay out every scene in your story. You can see we've got our different scenes from this story here. Let's say we wanna go ahead and add a new scene for the through the trapdoor sequence. So I'm gonna call this through the trap door. Uh, point of view for this, Harry Potter, scene number 16. And in this template, things start as an idea. Basically the idea behind this is you just dump everything into this idea section here. Then once you like a scene and you think you're gonna include it in your actual story, go over here, click it into outline and it will automatically appear in this section here. And basically the idea here is that you can create a good separation between things that you know you wanna include in the plot and things that you're just kind of messing around at the idea stage, but that's not really important for now. So through the trapdoor, let's take a look at this scene here. Basically our summary for this scene here is that Harry goes into the chambers underneath Hogwarts to prevent Snape from getting the Philosopher's Stone. And then we come into our scene structure template down here. So I just click this, 
And you'll see this basically loads in all the different components of the scene here. So you can write a little bit about what the scene is doing at an overall structure here. And then we come into the first piece here, which is the goal. What does your character want? So in this scene here, the goal is pretty simple. Harry wants to get the Philosopher's Stone before Voldemort does. So the goal of this scene is very simple. Harry wants to get the Philosopher's Stone before Voldemort does so that he can prevent Voldemort from coming back to life. And that's really all you need to write down for the goal in your scene. Keep things simple, let yourself know what your character is searching for here, and then move on to step number two of scene structure conflict. What is stopping your character from getting what they want? Perhaps it is a battle with an opponent or a struggle against the system. Maybe they're facing some kind of inner conflict with themselves. Perhaps they are racing against a certain limitation or barrier. Perhaps the character is fighting against an environment. Maybe your character's little fishing village is about to get swept away by a tsunami and they have to figure out how to use their magic to stop this. Your character could also be clashing with a belief, competing for a particular prize, or facing themselves being confronted by an unfamiliar and strange force. Now, there's a very common mistake that I see writers make with the conflict portion of their scene, and it is creating false conflict or false tension. So false conflict occurs when you create a complication, you create conflict that actually has nothing to do with the central spine of your story. For example, let's say that you're writing a fantasy story about a young girl who is mastering the art of dancing. And in this particular world, dancing is the way that you attract the notice and attention of the gods. And if you dance well enough for them, they grant you wishes, they grant you boons that you can then use to do different things in the world. So you can probably imagine that a lot of these scenes in the story are about this young girl training, about practicing her dance routine, maybe having rivals or other dancers out there who are trying to distract her from her own progression. But if you just randomly insert a scene where a long lost relative suddenly bequeaths a mansion, to your main dancer character girl. And now the main character has to deal with these lawyers who are trying to take it off her hands and she gets embroiled in this annoying legal battle. It's not really gonna feel that satisfying to your reader. And that's because it's completely and utterly irrelevant to your plot. It has nothing to do with the central spine of her learning how to use her dancing abilities to attract the attention of the gods. It doesn't serve to illuminate her character in the context of the primary struggle of the story. And it certainly doesn't develop the story's ideas about ambition and personal growth and how you receive attention from others in the world. So be really selective when choosing your conflict and make sure it aligns with the premise and the central ideas of your narrative. So in our scene from Harry Potter, the conflict here is that Harry, Ron and Hermione face various obstacles in the chambers beneath Hogwarts, including a giant chessboard with living pieces where Ron has to sacrifice himself so that Harry and Hermione can get past. So going back to our scene structure template here in Notion, the conflict for this scene is that Harry, Ron and Hermione face magical obstacles while trying to reach the stone, including a giant chess game where Ron sacrifices himself. Also, if you download this template, you can toggle these little features here to basically see possible conflict ideas and see possible goal ideas and other little bits and pieces throughout your story as well, which can be useful for helping you generate ideas and develop your outline. And this leads into the third piece of structuring your scene, which is the disaster. So the disaster is where something goes wrong. Perhaps your character is betrayed by an ally. Maybe they lose a particular resource. Perhaps a new threat appears. Maybe there's some kind of environmental catastrophe that absolutely wrecks things. There might be some kind of personal loss that occurs. Maybe the plan that your characters had initially fails. Your character might become entrapped or confined in a certain location. Maybe there's a secret that gets revealed and it totally changes the order of things. So right now you're probably wondering, Jed, why is the disaster so important? And I'd say it's very simple. It's because stories where things always go right for your main character are boring to read. It's only in moments of adversity and challenge that really force a character to grow. And it's only in those moments of difficulty that we truly come to understand who a person is at their core. The greater the adversity, the greater the depth of true character that is revealed. Now, this doesn't always mean that you have to write a 10 out of 10 disaster. I think the term disaster makes people think that you always need to create the most dramatic thing possible. That's not the case at all. Sometimes it can just be something really simple. Maybe your main character is trying to invite a friend out to a particular event and that friend is busy. That could be enough of a disaster. It's not a 10 out of 10 bad thing. It's maybe a two out of 10 or a three out of 10 thing depending on the occasion and the relationship. And in fact, you actually wanna be modulating the intensity of your disasters. If you just have five world-shaking, catastrophic bad things happen in a row, it runs the risk of boring your reader through repetition. 10 explosions in a row feels tiring, but stories that have some quiet moments, then moments of big action, and then some moments of sort of medium difficulty in between, 
that modulation in tension and that modulation in disaster creates intrigue, it creates a great sense of rhythm, and you feel much more pulled into those stories. Now, another key consideration with your disaster is that if you wanna create a cliffhanger ending in your chapter, right after the disaster is the perfect point to end your chapter. And that's because the disaster raises a bunch of questions within the reader's mind. Mostly, how is the character gonna to respond to this? How are they gonna deal with this thing that has just gone wrong? In fact, this is something that I always keep in mind when I'm writing, in particular, the first five chapters of my fantasy novels. So for example, when I was writing Across the Broken Stars, my space fantasy story about a fugitive and a cowardly war deserter trying to find a mythical safe haven in this world where people live on cities that float in space, I intentionally set out so that the first five or six chapters in this novel all ended right after the disaster portion of my scene structure. And the goal here is to make sure that readers get kind of hooked into the story, that you don't give them the ability to put the story down in those first couple of chapters. And then when you eventually give them a bit of a reprieve and you give them a sense of closure after they've gotten through that initial rush, hopefully by that stage, they've grown attached enough to the characters and the story that they just wanna keep continuing. And of course, it's important here that you don't end every single chapter right after the disaster, particularly if you're writing a big epic fantasy novel that's gonna get really exhausting for readers real quick. You do actually want some moments where the reader feels like they have completed a sequence in your story and they can go and sleep and eat or do whatever else they have to do in their life. And there's actually another part of scene structure where you can insert a chapter break to make sure this happens, which we'll get to later in this video. So going back to our Harry Potter example, the disaster in the Through the Trapdoor sequence happens when Harry gets to the final room where the Philosopher's Stone is kept. And he thinks this is where he's gonna uncover Snape attempting to steal the stone for Voldemort, but he doesn't find Snape there. Instead, he finds Quirrell, and it's revealed that Quirrell is the one who's been trying to steal the Philosopher's Stone all this time. So next we have our disaster, and here Harry reaches the final chamber alone and finds that it's actually not Snape who's been trying to steal the Philosopher's Stone, but rather it is Professor Quirrell who is working for Voldemort, and he's trying to find the stone to make Voldemort immortal. Okay, great, so we've got the first three pieces out of our six scene structure components here. We've got our goal, we've got our conflict, and we've got our disaster. Now these first three pieces form the action half of a scene. The next three steps I'm about to explain with you form the response half of the scene, and they're just as important, and many writers neglect these. Also, I should mention that if you would like my personal help to develop the scenes in your fantasy novel, then you should apply for the next cohort of my fantasy outlining bootcamp. After over a decade of writing and having published four books and a video game, I can tell you right now, outlining is the most valuable skill I've learned in that entire process. And in this seven week program, you'll work with myself and a small group of other fantasy writers to develop the outline of your story. And along the way, you'll learn how to effectively structure your plot, develop your character's arc, build interesting worlds, interesting settings, and bring it all together into a cohesive whole so that you can then write your story with confidence. We recently finished the first cohort of the bootcamp and here is what one of the students said. Hello, my name is Josiah Vandenberg and I recently finished Jed Hearn's Outlining Bootcamp and it's hard to express how valuable this experience has been for me. Jed has been wonderful to learn from, insightful and encouraging. He's given us great ideas for outlining, like learning the seven point plot structure, which has been perfect for my story. He's also given us good practices and methods for brainstorming and how to take ideas and a few concepts and really turn it into a story. How to take theme, setting, plot, and characters and weave them together. I highly recommend taking this course and I hope you get as much valuable out of it as I have. This program for me has been completely game changing. And now we get to step four in our six part scene structure. That is the reaction. So something just went wrong for your protagonist. How does that make them feel? That's what the reaction phase is all about. The character's emotional response to the disaster that just occurred. Maybe your character feels shock or grief or anger or fear, determination, doubt, despair, relief, or perhaps acceptance. And this is the step that really creates emotional bonding between your reader and your characters. So it's very important that you do this right. What you're doing here with the reaction component is you're bringing us into the internal emotional life and emotional experience of your character. By showing the vulnerability of your characters and really just bringing the reader into their internal emotional life and their emotional experience, you create a tremendous sense of sympathy and connection and bonding with them. This is where readers begin to identify with your characters because your readers have always had things that go wrong in their life as well. And so seeing a character go through the same process creates a tremendous sense of connection and identification with them. And another key thing to realize here is that the reaction phase, along with every single part of this six part structure I'm sharing with you here, it is flexible in length. Your reaction could be as short as one sentence or even a couple of words, or the reaction might span the course of several chapters or you know, even a whole part in your story if it's a 
major sequence of emotional fallout that a character might have from another character's death or from some major world-shaking event. All the pieces of scene structure that I'm sharing with you here are fractal in nature. Basically what I mean by fractal is that if you zoom in and you zoom out, it looks the same. Kind of like if you ever look at coastlines from Google Maps or something. It looks kind of the same pattern if you're looking at a coastline on a close scale or if you're looking at a coastline on a large scale. Story structure is a bit like that. Once you understand this sort of six part framework, you'll see it repeat at every individual unit of a story. You might even look at a chapter like the Harry Potter chapter we're going through, and you might think to yourself that it actually has this kind of action and reaction scene structure repeated maybe five or six times throughout it with every minor obstacle that Harry and Ron and Hermione encounter. Or you might be looking at the overall scope of things and just saying that's one action reaction component. So speaking of our Harry Potter example here, the reaction phase of this scene where Harry realizes that it's Quirrell, not Snape, is that he is shocked. This wasn't what he expected at all, and it's made him totally reevaluate his assumptions about Snape and Quirrell. So for Harry's reaction, when he finds that it's Quirrell and not Snape, he is really shocked and scared, but he stands his ground, and he basically kind of wraps his head around the fact that it's actually Quirrell that's been behind all the bad goings on, and that Snape has been a red herring this whole time. And this leads into the fifth step of our scene structure here, which is the dilemma. A disaster has just occurred for your character, they've reacted to it in an emotional way, and now they're presented with a choice. And this is really pivotal because again, true character is revealed in the choices a person makes under pressure. The greater the pressure you apply to them, the greater the depth of true character that is revealed. So in this dilemma portion, your character might be forced to sacrifice for a greater good. Maybe they're choosing between two desires and bonus points here if both of these outcomes seem equally bad. Maybe they're facing some kind of moral quandary. Perhaps they're having to decide between revenge or forgiveness. Perhaps they're deciding whether to abandon their plan or continue with it. Maybe they're trying to evaluate whether they should prioritize an individual's need or the collective good. And of course, there's many other decisions you can create for your characters to struggle with. In Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry is basically presented with the dilemma of how to stop Quirrell from getting the stone from the mirror of Erised, because he knows that once Quirrell gets the stone, Voldemort will have the ability to achieve immortality. So the dilemma Harry faces is how can he prevent Quirrell from getting the stone? And also equally importantly, how can Harry survive this encounter? And this brings us to the sixth and final step in structuring your scene, which is the decision. Here, your character picks a new goal to pursue. And decide actually comes from the Latin word decidere. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I really have no idea how to pronounce Latin. But it basically is a combination of two words. The first word is di, which means off. And the second word is cadere, which means cut. So cut off. When you decide, you are cutting off a possibility so that you can pursue a different possibility. In other words, cutting off something means you're making a decision. So to decide literally means to cut off everything but that which is important. So when your character makes a decision, they are literally cutting off part of their identity so they can assume a new identity or so they can take a new course of action. And this process of cutting off through the decisions a character makes is what creates a sense of a character evolving and changing and progressing throughout the course of your narrative. So in this phase of your scene, your character might decide to undertake a mission or form a partnership. Maybe they will decide to reveal a truth or tell a lie instead. Maybe they'll change the course of direction with the plan that they're taking. Perhaps they have to accept reality as their decision. Or maybe they need to confront someone, adopt a new role or challenge fate. Now, earlier on in this video, I mentioned how Ending your chapter at different points in this scene structure will create a different kind of feeling for readers and it is very pivotal for controlling the pacing and tension in your story. If you decide to end a chapter after the decision phase here, it creates a sense of completeness to the chapter because you've gone through this whole cycle and this whole loop of action and reaction readers will kind of feel like they have gone on a bit of a journey. And so it's often a good way to cut your chapters off after the decision to create a sense of a rest, but also to set readers up with the knowledge that a character is about to embark on a new plan at the start of the next chapter. This is very typical before the climactic sequence of most novels. As we approach the climax in most novels, they usually end with the main character making a decision to engage directly against the antagonist. For instance, they might decide to finally duel this antagonist tomorrow. And then we'll have our chapter break and then the next chapter begins that duel dueling sequence or begins the climactic sequence and usually each chapter from that point onwards will always end right after the disaster which creates this kind of avalanche sensation of propelling the reader through the story not giving them any moments to rest because you're constantly hitting them with cliffhangers for the last 10 to 20 percent of your novel so that they really feel a tremendous sense of tension and engagement in the climax sequence of your book. Now there's one very important thing to understand with scene structure before this video finishes and it is that this process I've shared with you of action and reaction which is divided up into goal, conflict, 
Disaster, reaction, dilemma, and decision is actually circular in nature. Once you've gone through all of those six steps and the character has made their decision at the end, that then loops into a new goal. The decision gives your character a new goal to pursue. And so your story is really made up of a sequence of these looping scene structures all throughout the course of your narrative. And this loop repeats over and over again. So to close out our Harry Potter example, the decision Harry makes is to directly engage with Quirrell and he decides to do whatever it takes to stop him and stop Voldemort getting the stone, even though he thinks this may cost him his life. So in our scene here, Harry decides to fight Quirrell even at the risk of dying and he's willing to sacrifice himself if it stops Voldemort from coming back to life. And once again, this whole template here, uh, including the sort of section before where you can map out all your different scenes like this, there's a link in the description if you want to download it and use it in your own writing. Now having great scene structure is just one part of the plotting puzzle, but you also need to make sure you're avoiding the common plot mistakes that I see new fantasy writers make all the time. So if you want to learn more about how to avoid these nine rookie mistakes I've identified, then go ahead and watch this video over here.